on March 20th, 2012, OSHA announced that it was updating the hazard communication standard to be in line with the globally harmonized system of classification and labeling of chemicals known as GHS. Under this new standard, this is referred to as HAZCOM 2012. Questions have been asked, what are the benefits and regulations of GHS, and also, who does it affect? The main government agencies affected by GHS are DOT, OSHA, EPA, and CPSC. Under these four government agencies that are currently using the GHS system are DOT and OSHA. GHS is actually a set of recommendations. It is not a regulation. So what needs to happen in order for GHS to become effective in any given country is it has to be adopted by government agencies or regulatory bodies in that country. So here in the United States, for example, OSHA adopted GHS into its hazard communication standard, and that is what we're calling HAZCOM 2012, and that is what is actually the regulation here in the United States. GHS is really an attempt to have an international approach to hazard communication. So the goal of GHS is to provide the same way of classifying hazards and the same format and content for labels and material safety data sheets, which under the new HAZCOM 2012 regulation are gonna be called safety data sheets. GHS utilizes a building block approach and basically what that does is it allows competent authorities such as OSHA and EPA and DOT, basically government agencies, to adopt the portions that make sense for them. For example, OSHA did not adopt the GHS aquatic toxicity classifications because OSHA doesn't have any jurisdiction over environmental issues. So that would be something EPA would have to adopt. Due to the building block approach, OSHA was able to independently move forward. And just as a note, the U.S. Department of Transportation adopted GHS years ago. Will employees need to be trained? Oh yes, absolutely. They will need to be trained. And uh, this is a requirement uh, that's under the law and the new uh, guidelines. Uh, this is the first um, major uh, upgrade to these standards we've had in a generation. And it's going to incorporate not only uh, safety information for the workers, but also environmental and transportation information in one place. And because there are now symbols that are being used, which we've never had in the U.S., as well as a new classification system for hazard, uh, the law requires that employees be trained. The compliance dates for both businesses and distributors kind of fall this way. Uh, by the end of 2013, uh, you're going to have training already completed for the new system and familiarization with the new safety data sheet format, and that's for all employers. Now, most businesses won't have to complete with all elements of the new standard until June 1st of 2015. And finally, distributors can continue to sell product labeled under the old format up until December 1st of 2015. By, by June 1st, 2016, employers are going to have to have trained their employees on the basic elements of the new system. They will have to have labeled or relabeled things throughout their facility to comply. Now in the old days, you might have had HMIS or NFPA, and you can still use those, but they can't in any way conflict with the new system, which in some cases may require some changes. Also, there may be new hazards that are identified that aren't recognized by, for instance, NFPA. In that case, you've got to kind of supersede that. You've got to have those GHS compliant um, uh, warnings and symbols in place uh, throughout your facility. Under OSHA's new system, there are 30 hazard classes, which are broken into two types of hazards, physical hazards and health hazards. Under the 30 hazard classes, four are not described by GHS, but are considered to be OSHA-defined hazards. These four hazard classes are combustible dust, pyophoric gas, simple asphyxiant, and hazard not otherwise classified. Specific criteria will be used to classify chemicals and mixtures. In some cases, employees will see no difference how a chemical product is classified. In other cases, 
the product will appear to be more hazardous than it used to be. For example, a product that was labeled flammable under the old system may be labeled extremely flammable under the new system. This will not necessarily mean that the product has been reformulated or has become more dangerous. In many cases, new label warnings will be required solely based on the different classification criteria, not because of any changes to the actual product. Under HASCOM 2012, hazards are broken down into classes, and classes are broken down into categories which indicate the severity of the hazard within each class. This table shown here represents the physical hazard classification structure adopted by OSHA. You will notice that not all classes have the same number of categories. In this health hazard classification structure, notice that the aspiration hazards have a single category while carcinogens are broken into two categories and acute toxicity is broken into four categories. There are also subcategories for some classes. For example, the skin corrosion irritation class is divided into two categories. Category 1 is for corrosives and Category 2 is for irritants. Category 1 is divided into three subcategories, 1A, 1B, 1C, with 1A being the most corrosive. Unfortunately, HMIS and NFPA appear to work opposite of GHS. Under GHS, the most hazardous chemicals within a class are assigned to Category 1 with categories 2, 3, and 4, as applicable, being lower level hazards. If you are familiar with DOT's packing groups, this makes sense. As you know, packing group 1 material is the highest hazard. HMIS and NFPA assign the highest risk to level 4. At this time, there are no plans for HMIS or NFPA to update their systems to match GHS. Labels in order to be compliant under the new HASCOM 2012 system are going to have to include some very specific label elements, and as a result, they may change substantially in appearance. The required label elements are product identifier, which is the name of the product, pictograms, signal words, hazard statements, and precautionary statements, as well as the name, address, and phone number of the manufacturer. HASCOM 2012 says that a safety data sheet must be presented in a 16-part format. Within each section, OSHA requires certain information to be disclosed. An important thing to remember is that SDSs contain more detailed information about chemical products than the label has room to accommodate. Before using a chemical product, an employee should always read both the label and the SDS. While it's required that the SDS format have sections 12, 13, 14, and 15, OSHA has no real jurisdiction over environmental and transportation issues. Thus, it's kind of up to each company to decide what they want to put into each one of those sections. By transitioning to GHS to meet the needs of their customers around the world, LPS has invested SDS authoring software that facilitates authoring SDS in different formats and languages. Products launched in 2013 and beyond will be labeled according to HASCOM 2012 and accompanied by a matching SDS. Their existing product line will be transitioned over the next two years in order to meet the June 1st, 2015 deadline. Well, questions certainly have been raised in terms of why we should have to go through all this, uh, what effect is it going to have, and is it going to mean that, that products are going to have to be reformulated and changed? Well, there will be major uh, big changes. I should say, in how we classify and label products in, in somewhat new and unfamiliar ways. Uh, when comparing a, a GHS formatted data sheet to the old OSHA format, uh, there's going to be a striking distance. It'll be shocking in a way. Uh, the age of a one or two page safety data sheet is basically gone. Does this mean manufacturers will have to reformulate their product in order to comply with the new GHS system? Well, well not necessarily and certainly not in all cases. Uh, but in a few instances, uh, we will have a, um, a choice to make, a trade-off, if you will. Uh, you could uh, keep the formula exactly the same, performs the way it always has, but uh, the hazard warnings will be uh, a bit more frightening, a bit more uh, uh, of concern to certain end users. Um, on the other hand, you could, you could reformulate in those instances, 
Uh, for example, with a contact cleaner, you might uh, reformulate it so that it avoids certain uh, risk phrases that might alarm customers, but that might make it take twice as long to dry. And at the end of the day, that might be a worse thing to do to the product than it would be to simply update the label. LPS will be updating their warning appearance on the labels. Understand, this will not necessarily mean their pioneering products has been reformulated or that it's become more dangerous. LPS product regulations continue to evolve with increasing emphasis on environment and worker safety. GHS HASCOM 2012 is a global effort to ensure more uniform, harmonized system throughout the industrial market. Their goal is to bring clarity and increase safety awareness in the workplace whole, providing for business growth and sustainability. To learn more about GHS and how these changes will be affecting LPS labeling, go to www.lpslabs.com or contact your local regional sales manager at 1-800-241-8334.